Good morning, everybody, and or good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar. Um, my name is Lisa Mallon. I'm an EHS executive at GE Renewable Energy, but today I'm delighted to be the chair of this session. Our industry is facing, like every industry, some unprecedented challenges this year with the pandemic. But in addition to that, our industry also faces some rapid growth and development. And part of what we'd like to talk about today and the reason we're here is to make sure we're starting to start some conversations about how those hazards are managed. How are we thinking about our future challenges? How are we dealing with the challenges that are here right now? So I'm delighted that the Energy Institute are able to produce this webinar opportunity. A big thanks to our uh, knowledge partner, IBM, for partnering with us on the event. And also a big thanks to Steel River Consultants for sponsoring the webinar. We have a great agenda lined up for you today. Um, before I get into the detail, let me just run through some running rules for the session. So firstly, um, just to let you know, your microphones have all been muted, um, as well as your cameras been switched off if you hadn't already done that for yourself. And part of the reason for that is we are recording this seminar. Um, and we will then la later post a link on the Energy Institute website and send it directly to you. So we want to make sure that the sound is clear and everybody has an opportunity to participate at the same time. We will have a Q&A session at the end and the Q&A session um, we will do directly over the Q&A box that you see on your WebEx link at the right hand side. You do not have to wait till the end of the session to post a question. Please put your questions in there, direct them to me. And it means when we get to the Q&A session, I will have an opportunity to ask your questions directly to the speakers. So lastly, just on the mechanics of the session, the webinar, just to remind you, will not be run under Chatham House rules. It is being recorded and it will be posted after the session to the Energy Institute website. So with that, let me talk a little bit about the agenda for today. We have five speakers in total with us today. We have three different sessions in its entirety. So we're going to start off with some lightning talks. We're going to have a couple of speakers there and we're going to ask them to pick a particular topic. And in this case, it will be talking about safety on and the G plus um, organization and talking about the work that those organizations do to help our industry collaborate together from a wind perspective and wind and safety and managing hazards perspective. We then going to move to a fireside chat where we have an additional three panelists for you to hear from today. They will introduce themselves and then they're also going to take some questions from me um, on safety, health, environment and sustainability. And hopefully it will give you some thoughts and ideas to ask questions of your own for the last session, which is an open Q&A. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to get together, albeit virtually as an industry, uh, talk about the things that matter to us and you know, challenge each other with some testing thoughts and questions that we can take into future discussions. So with that, let me move directly to the lightning talks session and welcome our first speaker, uh, Dave Griffiths. Uh, I've known Dave myself for several years, let's say. <laughs> um, but Dave, um, Dave has a fascinating background. He, you know, he's extensive experience across many industries, petrochemical, oil and gas, and he's currently the head of safe, healthy environment for SSE Renewables, where he manages onshore, offshore, hydro, right through from development stage, right through to decommissioning where appropriate. But he is also the vice chair of the G Plus board. So Dave, let me hand over to you. Thanks very much, Lisa. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, let me just get organised with the slide access here. Bear with me a second. Okay, thanks very much. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I'm Dave Griffiths. I uh, work for SEC Renewables uh, as their Head of Safety, Health and Environment. 
and I also cover uh, the role as Vice Chair of G Plus Board. So I'm delighted today just to take the opportunity to give you a bit of background on the work that G Plus has been doing to support the offshore wind uh, industry uh, internationally. Um, I think for me, um, the key point is that we're going to, you know, we're looking to assist the sector uh, within offshore wind, and it's all about continuous improvement. So I've got a few slides just to take you through. Um, so G Plus' ambition is to facilitate world-class health and safety performance through collaboration. So why health and safety? It's very simple. We want to send more people home safely. As with other industry sectors, we experience incidents resulting in harm to our employees and our contractors, and sadly, in some cases, fatalities. That's not just G Plus member sites, but throughout the whole industry. Some of the significant incidents are highlighted in this slide, and I guess are a stark reminder of what can go wrong. I always find it quite sobering when we look back, as I'm sure that you do too. To assist our sector, we've produced a suite of supporting information, such as the following. Incident data reports, good practice guidelines, safe by design workshops, and sharing of lessons learned. And I'll cover those in a little bit more detail as we work our way through the slides. So looking at the 2019 incident data, um, and this is available, there's a full report available on the G Plus website, so I'd encourage you to have a look at that. So as a positive, we had no fatalities recorded in 2019, but sadly we averaged an injury every three days and a dropped object every four days in that period. And nearly a third of those incidents also had a high potential. It has been challenging to get a reporting structure in place and ensure that all our members are reporting on a comparable basis. And the Energy Institute have done a fantastic job so far, and we're confident we have a good baseline to work from. And as I mentioned earlier, you can access all this information uh, on the G Plus website, and I, I would encourage you to do so. In terms of membership, um, so the members are committed to promoting and maintaining the highest possible standards of health and safety throughout the life cycle of offshore wind farms. The G Plus members are all owners and lead operators of offshore wind farms, or the OEMs. And there are also associate members who are developers, grid operators, or investors. And you can see the members list. So the top two uh, rows there, I won't work through all the way through um, the members, but also the associate members are on lines three and four. And that continues to grow uh, as we progress and as the um, organisation grows, uh, as the industry grows. So we're, we're, we're very keen and we're expanding internationally. And I'll, I'll touch on that at the end. You'll see that we've got a fantastic mixture of experience and we are all committed to collaboration because that's key. We, we will be more successful if we collaborate. Looking at what the G Plus produces, um, I, I touched on that earlier on. Um, so we develop, distribute, and maintain the following documents. And there's also a newsletter posted on the G Plus website promoting our latest focused areas and activities. And I encourage you to take the time to look at that content. So to summarise, we've got the instant data reports. That gives us an understanding of offshore wind industry risk profiles, provides evidence based to inform interventions, and also gives an accurate assessment of the industry's health and safety performance overall. And it's a great tool for comparing um, our sector with uh, health and safety performance across other comparable industries. The good practice guidelines, they provide recommendations for procedures, controls, ways of working for offshore wind farms. They develop minimum standards expected to meet industry health and safety expectations. There are also some self-check compliance checks that you can carry out against the good practice guidelines as well. So from a continuous improvement perspective, there's an opportunity there to tap into that information to make sure A, that you're compliant, B, identify your gaps, and C, build those into your improvement plans. And generally, the reference in the site and company corporate documents, including contracts, we're very keen to raise the bar uh, within the sector, and this has been a fantastic vehicle for that. Moving on, Safe by Design workshops and associated reports. They examine the current design controls relating to the specific topic. They discuss whether the design has potentially failed or could be improved. Um, and the outputs are published and used as a reference by the industry. It also acts as a catalyst for further discussion and research within the industry, but it's a great baseline to tap into when you're looking at your, uh, your overall design um, from a, a wind farm perspective. And probably one of the most important areas is, is sharing instant learnings. Um, it's, a, it's a key component of collaboration, as I mentioned. The Energy Institute have a, a, an application called Toolbox, 
Um, it's accessible to all, um, anywhere, any place, any time. That's a great uh, strap line there. But um, again, I would tap into that. Um, it's, develop it's been developed on the back of some work done in the oil and gas sector. But again, it's a really important tool. It's a great opportunity to, for us to share our learnings and hopefully prevent uh, the, a similar uh, or recurrence um, within the sector. So looking a little bit more detail at good practice guidelines, um, I think you'll... Uh, You'll see that the G Plus is uniquely placed to draw on experience across the global offshore wind sector when you see our membership. We're driven by the incident data and we take a focused approach to delivering the right guidance for the industry. The good practice guidelines have been approved by the G Plus board after going through a process of robust data analysis and discussion and review within the supporting uh, focus group, which underpins the work that the G Plus uh, undertake. In terms of the topics that we've covered so far, um, we have covered offshore wind farm transfers, working at height, the safe management of small vessels, reduction of manual handling and ergonomic incidents, reduction of dropped objects, emergency response and ladder climbing research. So very, very pertinent topics to the sector. And as I said, very much born from the data that we've derived since we started uh, capturing all the incident data across the sector. And we'll continue to build on that. And again, I'll touch on that at the end. In terms of safe by design workshops, again, this is really just to give you a flavour of the breadth of topics that we've analysed so far. So they cover the following marine transfer and access, escape from a nacelle in the event of a fire, service lifts, davit cranes, turbine access and egress, turbine access to the transition piece below the airtight deck, and torque and tensioning of bolts. Again, as mentioned previously, all of this information is available uh, to reference. And we really want to make sure that safety is designed in and not an afterthought. So please use this reference information. It, 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 it's, it will underpin your design. And looking at our um, ongoing and current work streams. So we have a communication uh, work stream, which we seek to ensure that we continue to engage internationally and raise awareness. We're looking at physical and medical requirements for the offshore wind uh, workforce. Obviously, we're getting further offshore. That brings its own challenges. With those challenges, we want uh, to consider awareness of health and well-being issues uh, for the staff involved. We have developed helicopter uh, and good practice guidelines. Uh, they will be published in due course. And we are always looking to develop um, further Safe by Design workshop content. And we will continue to work in the international sector and continue to reach out uh, work with the regulators and work, work with the uh, the relevant uh, parties within the international space to um, support the offshore wind. I seem to have lost control. Could you just move this, the slide on to the last one, please, host? Apologies for this. And then just to summarise, um, this gives a summary of our web and social media links. Uh, I'd encourage you all to use the information available and that you can access through the, the G Plus website. We want to assist delivering safe outcomes internationally across all of your organisation. And there is a wealth of information a wealth of information available. Please tap into it. And I'd like to thank everybody for your time. And uh, I'll hand on to uh, David Armour. So before David starts, let me let me just introduce him formally. So David, for those who don't know him yet, is the director of HSEQ at Natural Power. He's been in the health and safety for the last 15 years, but started his career as a mechanical maintenance engineer. So I think that gives him a very good perspective on some of the risks that we manage and deal with on a daily basis in the wind sector. He's a chartered member of IOSH. But in addition, he also chairs the Safety on Technical Advisory Committee, also known as the TAC. So, David, welcome and uh, look forward to hearing your discussion. Thanks very much. I'll just again, I'll put it, take control of these slides. Um, there we go. Right. Make sure this is working. Yes. OK, so thanks for, yeah, as uh, I'm not going to kind of further on from what Lisa said there. Yep. Yeah, um, just very quickly go on to what safety on is. Um, so, I'll give you a wee bit of history. Safety on is a, it's quite a new organisation compared to the likes of G Plus. We're very, very similar. Simply put, safety on is the onshore equivalent of what G Plus does. 
Um, can I take you back to 2018? The UK regulator, the HSE, um, reached out to all the stakeholders on, from the onshore wind industry and invited us all uh, to a meeting at their headquarters in Bootle in the UK. Uh, at that meeting, they raised a lot of concerns about essentially the health and safety performance of the industry. And uh, we were asked, you know, essentially get your house in order or, you know, we'll come in and help you with that. So from that point on, our UK uh, then facilitates some of the meetings uh, following that Bootle meeting. And from them, we agreed that uh, we would form our own onshore safety body. Uh, from that, the first safety on meeting was held on the seventh of November, twenty eighteen. First, uh, that was the technical advisory committee, and uh, the, the leadership board was the twenty sixth of November. After that, um, so I'll just very quickly move on to not oh, that's backwards. Sorry. Uh, okay. So what do we do? Essentially, the aim of safety on is to provide leadership in health and safety across the onshore sector. At the moment, we're UK orientated. But obviously, there's an appetite to expand that in the coming years. OK, um, we drive a consistent approach through collaboration. So essentially what that means is we all sit, share information, understanding, common practices uh, around the table and basically allow each organisation to learn from that. We do carry risk mitigation through cooperation and shared learnings, basically what I touched on before there. Yeah. Uh, and again, we are facilitated through the Energy Institute. Reason behind that, the Energy Institute's got a good um, performance record with the G plus. We thought, you know, they know what they're doing and we are looking for a very similar organization. So they were the, they were the logical choice to kind of help us with that. Some of the other things we do is we provide a single industry voice in matters and health and safety. So up until two years ago, the, the regulator, the HSE, had to communicate with each uh, kind of stakeholder of the industry independently. We now allow them to communicate to the entire industry via safety on, which is very, very uh, welcome uh, by the, HS, the HSE. And essentially, as it says there at the bottom, we do employ thousands within our sector, and uh, we just we're, we're playing a part in making sure they all go home uh, safe and sound. So, similar slide to uh, Dave's, um, we, Safe, Safety On has got two tiers of membership. So, this is the tier one. Uh, to be a tier one member, it's uh, you need to basically a developer, OEM or service provider with around 200 megawatts of a portfolio to be in control. So, as you can see there, there's some of the, the kind of most significant stakeholders of the uh, within the industry represented on that slide there. Safety One is currently, the leadership board is currently chaired by Scottish Power by Lindsay McQuaid, uh, the CEO of Scottish Power Renewables. Uh, and as, as I've said earlier on, I chair the Technical Advisory Committee, which is a, a kind of board of uh, the all these organisations, safety professionals generally sit around the table. From Tier 1, it then moves into uh, the Tier 2. So the Tier 2 are other organisations that maybe do not have that UK 200 megawatt portfolio or provide other types of service, services. So as you can see there, there are um, some of the balance of plant, civils, uh, a lot of training organisations in there, uh, kind of help us there. And again, absolutely uh, integral to what we do. These are these are the people, these are the organisations that kind of help us in a really in a significant way in developing um, our work streams and our strategies moving forward. So, just to touch on that, the work programs. So, this is the work programs for 2021. So, this is a kind of idea of what we've achieved in the last couple of years as well. So, the things that we look at, uh, just to pull some of the kind of more significant ones out of that list. Similar, similar to G Plus, we also do data collection, validation, and analysis. We are currently pulling together our first year that's due to come to completion, obviously, in December. Uh, we're looking to get our first data report out, instant data report out, Q1 2021. Again, that will be on our website. Um, obviously, you know, we're caveating everything at the moment. I would say any data pulled over this year is probably not very representative of the industry uh, because of COVID, essentially. Um, we've also taken kind of ownership of the wind turbine safety rules, uh, which is a 
that, I mean, I'm not, for, for anyone that doesn't know what that is, that's essentially the safe system of work around protecting our workers from electrical and mechanical risks uh, associated with the turbines. Um, we did uh, work, we were challenged by the HSE, they had concerns for, about our personnel working under suspended loads. So again, we carried out a safe by design workshop on working under suspended loads and came, came up with some very, very interesting solutions to that. Um, we've, we're taking on traffic management, uh, demolition and decommissioning activities, and just kind of looking again, again, there's, a, there's an interest in the toolbox that from the Energy Institute we'll be looking at picking up potentially next year, and uh, confined space entry to the uh, turbines as well as another one that we're looking at for 2021. But the main kind of piece of work that we have done this year, as you may understand, as you may kind of appreciate, is so we produced a guidance document, a COVID-19 guidance document, very early in the year. Um, so as you all know, we all uh, within the UK we got um, lockdown in March, for March time. Um, we safety on very quickly decided that obviously the nature of our activities, you know, onshore, remote, the sites are spread out. We've actually got generally low personnel numbers. We believe that we could maintain and continue operating during the, the lockdown. So as such, we, we were tasked with developing our own guidance document to help our members come up to come up with ideas to inform their safe systems of work. So as it says, the, the intent was to develop a document that consists consisted of high level principles. What we didn't want to do is write our compliance manual. Our members are all different types of organizations with different resources. So you know, we, could, we couldn't give them a list of instructions to follow. They had to be so high level that they could be interpreted for each organisation. Um, the idea was to direct the user of the document to relevant guidance from the UK and devolved governments, in addition to including information from the WHO and the NHS. So, yeah, basically, kind of guidance from reputable sources. Um, just to kind of help help them make kind of decisions and how we keep their staff safe. So the guidance, the first version of the guidance, the, the but guidance is now in version nine. Um, the first version of the guidance originally covered the O&M activities within the, the industry. We were very concerned that if we were shut down, uh, for the, the turbines themselves, they, as, as most of us know, they do need constant kind of maintenance, inspection, supervision. And we were worried that obviously the, uh, the turbines would cease to function. So we uh, we completed the O&M activity guidance and then moved very quickly into the construction activities. Uh, then we also picked up return to uh, the office. And the most recent version, we've kind of focused on mental health and wellbeing within the workforce. Um, to develop the guidance, we have uh, involvement from the HSE, Renewable UK. We've been working with the unions in the UK uh, and government, and it's, we're very pleased that the Scottish government has now considered our guidance as the onshore uh, guidance document on their own website. So if you go on and add, type in renewable safety COVID guidance, you'll be steered towards our website from their website, and kind of, uh, kind of be, and you can follow our guidance to inform your safe system more. So I mean, essentially, that's that's it uh, for ourselves. Um, we're kind of. Every, every Friday, we're still kind of revisiting this document, making sure we're trying to keep in line with the, the many changes that is, is happening within the government. But uh, yeah, that's that's essentially us. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, and I'll catch questions from you at the end. Hey, thank you, David. And um, that's a, a perfect reminder because I personally don't see any questions yet in the question box. So. A nice remem reminder for everybody, you don't need to wait to the end of the Q&A session. Please go to the chat function. If anything that any David Armour or David Griffiths has, has posed a thought for you, that you want to have a question at the end of the session, then please put it in the box just now, um, and then we can start to tally them up. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, we'll hear from you for sure in the Q&A session. 
So our next, um, our next session for today is what we're calling our fireside chat, and we have three panelists here today for you for this session. The first one, um, when we when we get kick off in a second, we're going to talk um, to panelists from Orsted, from IBM, and also from Steel River Consultants. And they're going to be taking questions based on some of the agenda topics that you've seen. So. I will hand over to these guys, let them introduce themselves and um, and take you through some of their thoughts. And, and please add your questions into the chat as we go. Um, so that when we get to Q&A, you have plenty of opportunity to discuss. So Hassa, over here. Thanks, uh, Lisa, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, just to, to introduce myself briefly, I am uh, Hassa Andreasen. Uh, HCC director uh, at Ørsted Offshore. Um, so basically looking after our full uh, business value chain from development um, through uh, EPC and into operations and asset management. Um, and um, again, thanks for, for having me. Um, and uh, I must admit when, uh, when I was sort of challenged uh, in terms of what what do you want to talk about? Uh, I was uh, also uh, going into a bit of a stubborn uh, stubbornness, uh, uh, thinking around. Uh, let let let's try to avoid uh, the famous uh, these days uh, COVID nineteen topic. Um, however, when I when I then uh, started to look at our sort of uh, strategy, our key priorities. Um, I quickly realized that even uh, I, I didn't necessarily want to put a lot of uh, emphasis uh, around uh, the, the impacts from, from COVID. Uh, it, it, it's actually quite difficult because um, more or less everything we do uh, today uh, has been impacted by, by the pandemic. Um, and, and thus, it, it, it wouldn't make sense eventually uh, to, to just ignore. Um, I want to, to actually take the approach uh, a bit today also that initially uh, in Austria, we, we did discuss uh, like obviously, um, first of all, like like from a business continuity perspective, um, how are we able to, to carry on uh, with, with, uh, with the least of, of impacts um, from an operational perspective or commercial perspective even. Um, secondly, we, we, we started to discuss like, like uh, health, soft health impacts uh, to, to people's uh, like mental health, uh, obviously also the, um, uh, the physical health in terms of actually the, the being affected or the, the risk of being contaminated. Um, but then more like you can say management uh, from, from the top asked uh, uh, the QHC department, how do we think this will impact our heart safety performance? And initially we said, uh, well, uh, we, we, we believe uh, uh, even potentially this will have a positive effect because people will be more uh, risk averse, uh, uh, will start thinking about just basically health and safety um, due to the prevailing circumstances. Um, we have learned though, um, looking sort of in, in, in the Rear mirror now that that actually we have seen uh, somehow a negative impact uh, to our safety performance and of course there can be numerous statistical confounders uh, talking about what is the root cause for that but uh, overall um, definitely we uh, we have uh, increasing concerns around how to engage our uh, supply chain uh, how to engage our own workforce. Um, and, and, and basically keep the discipline around uh, following procedures, um, uh, doing your risk assessments, uh, just, just basically the human interaction uh, we would normally have at the sites on board the vessels. So I think that would be my opening statement and introduction. Thanks. Thank you, Habit, Hab, um, Hasse. Robert, yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Darienzo, and uh, I am the global strategy leader uh, for energy utilities at IBM. 
Uh, I'm part of what we call our weather services team, uh, which is essentially uh, the services team that was formed uh, shortly after IBM acquired uh, the weather company. And uh, just as some background, you know, we're talking about safety. Um, you know, safety was you know one of the really big drivers of why IBM decided to to buy the weather company. Um, so so safety is always first and foremost in terms of uh, not just uh, you know harnessing uh, you know better weather data, but looking at ways in which we can deliver those data uh, to, to our customers. Um, so you know. I'm essentially, uh, you know, here to talk about, um, you know, we're, especially with recent events, you know, we're really focused on uh, how do we help utilities become more resilient, right? So, you know, we have, you know, 2020 is just the year of, of multiple challenges, right, for, for our utilities, right? And, uh, you know, combating elements of climate change in terms of more extreme frequent weather events, um, you know, really trying to help uh, utilities understand those events better, better prepare for those events, um, but also look at from a longer range perspective in terms of how do we actually quantify uh, the risks, but also the opportunities uh, from, from climate change. Um, so really want to focus and we'll talk about later in terms of how do we help kind of uh, juggle multiple risks, you know, from the weather side, the pandemic side, uh, you know, is this becoming, uh, you know, much more challenging for for energy companies to to interact? And you know, IBM is very interested um, in in helping utilities uh, both from a preparation perspective, but also as these events unfold, uh, how do they um, uh, respond better um, even after the event? Um, so so happy to be here and uh, looking forward to the uh, discussions later. Thank you, Robert. And Graham, please introduce yourself on your opening statement. Yeah, rookie error. Unmute myself might help. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Graham Tyman. I'm Managing Director of Steel River Consultants, a uh, consultancy that specialises in health and safety. We've been supporting the renewables industry for the past 12 years. Steel River has been up and running for, for 10 years uh, and work with both onshore and offshore renewables. Um, what I want to just challenge the the, uh, the participants and notice we haven't got many questions and answers at the moment but not looking and focusing on covid opening a, a bit a bit wider with regards to the challenges we've got health and safety wise as we go um future for the offshore side is bigger and deeper uh, we're going further afield with regards to manufacturing and fabrication um, and that brings in additional challenges with regards to safety and how we control safety, how we ensure our ethos is spread across to the fabrication yards we're working with. But we're seen as a green industry. Um, is, that, is that tag going to be challenged if we're bringing um, shipping of larger components, larger items from across the globe? How does that impact on fuel costs, fuel usage, burnage rates, etc.? How are we actually looking at that in, in, in the green factor? Are we talking to our supply chains? Are we talking to our procurement team? And are we, as a collective safety industry, are we actually challenging that? Are, are we doing the, the checks and verica verifications and balances with regards to that? So again, yeah, welcome questions um, for for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Graham and, and Hassan and Rob. If I could get you to turn your cameras back on, that would be good. And let the panelists see you. So again, just as a reminder, please feel free, and I encourage you to put some questions in the Q and A chat box. Direct them to me, Lisa Mallon. And then we can use them in the, the session that's coming up after the fireside chat.
So Hassa, um, let me let me go back to you first of all, and talk a little bit more about you know the start of the pandemic versus where we are now, and what were your learnings as an organisation? In hindsight, what would you have done something different? Yeah, thanks for that uh, question, uh, Lisa. I think. Um, First of all, let me be uh, very open and honest uh, by saying uh, when when the pandemic uh, hit, uh, sort of yeah, uh, obviously uh, the world, but not least uh, us and, and and the wind industry, uh, we we were definitely not prepared uh, at all. Um, uh, we uh, we obviously had our our sort of uh, basic uh, contingency processes in place. Uh, we had. Uh, templates uh, um, um, ready uh, for 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 contingency plans. Uh, however, um, when I look at back at the uh, uh, when I look back at the timeline, I must say that that I mean uh, sort of February, we were going full steam with um, preparing specific business continuity plans around the COVID situation for all parts of of. Uh, the Oster business, uh, including our power plants here in Denmark as well. And then suddenly, uh, I guess, uh, March came and, and uh, we were in the middle of, of dealing uh, with uh, the, the pandemic at our sites, uh, talking about uh, testing regimes, talking about isolating, building up barriers uh, in terms of having procedures uh, to, to separate and distance uh, personnel and, and, and PPE. Uh, regime all that so so uh, we never really managed to to plan uh, uh, from from a contingency perspective which is uh, quite scary actually uh, when when you look at that like um, our, our company or, or the, the the industry as such being hit by other unforeseen uh, catastrophic events uh, and the question to what extent we actually prepared or not no I I, I... Absolutely echo what you said. You know, I, I feel the industry as a whole um, were taken by surprise, not by the prospect of a pandemic, but but by the contingency you would actually have to have in place once it was here. So, you know, it's a learning opportunity for sure. It's been a very significant learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. And Graham, I don't know if you want to add in there. I mean, it's your experience working across maybe different companies. Did you see any? Great practices, or what would you rec recognise as something we should do differently if we had this hit again? I think, I mean, uh, we. Graham, um, sorry, the question was to Graham. I think he's on. Yeah. I think he's <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There he is. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we do work with. Uh, a, a wide variety of cross section of industry, and it's been a mixed reaction. Um, we are actually doing COVID secure audits on behalf of the insurance companies, and that gives us a good insight into good practice and poor practice. Uh, and one of the challenges at the beginning was the knee jerk reaction from various companies of um, putting trying to put control measures in place that were actually creating additional risks. So they were advising companies and people, you know, not, not to hold handrails when, when walking downstairs because it was a touch point. Yeah. Now, are we introducing an additional risk by, by doing that? Well, yes, we are. Uh, and what we've got to look at is, you know, are the control measures we're putting in sensible? Um, are they commensurate with what we're doing? Um, and can we reduce the the level of impact and people on sites? You know, do can we reduce down to non-essential people? And to what level can we actually go before it starts having an impact on health and safety? No, thank you. And Rob, before I come on to you, I, I just want to go back to Hassa a little bit and talk about you know what is more long term what what do we need to do to make sure we do have the right level of business continuity what's your what's your thoughts from orsted 
Uh, thanks, second Lisa. So, so um, I, I think actually from from our perspective, it's 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 starting now to to become more a question of how we move. Uh, you can say uh, from uh, a contingency mode, uh, emergency contingency mode, and and into some sort of standard modus operandi. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, yes, we still have our our uh, uh, BCPs in place, and and to some extent, we are obliged to to have that by by authorities uh, and industry standards, um, grid code, and so forth. Um, however, uh, we have def definitely directed our efforts uh, now more into actually starting to build in the pandemic um, way of operating. Uh, or even like a standard operating procedure into our process landscape, not not because we believe that this will be the way of life uh, for all eternity going forward, but it's just, on the other hand, uh, this situation is definitely not uh, diminishing short term or going away uh, tomorrow. So, um, so we are trying to, you can say, I, I would almost say reinvent the business from an operational perspective when it comes to HSC according to the new uh, rules, uh, so to speak. No, I, I think that's a great point. It's a great point. Uh, and it goes back to what we we're saying about not losing the opportunity to learn and um, and to make sure that we are more prepared for the whole life cycle and, and what that actually means. And the fact that it, pandemics are not going to last three months and be finished. They, it's going to continue. So Rob, I'm excited to have you here today. Um, it brings a little bit of a different aspect to our discussion and it allows us to move slightly off the subject of COVID, which I know um, maybe the listeners will be delighted and I know some of the panel will be happy to hear as well. But I'm, I'm curious from, from your perspective and your role in the industry, and, and you mentioned about balancing risks, what 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 is what role does data and AI play play in this new era of industry? Where is the IBM fitting in? Yeah, so this is a great question, Lisa. Um, so you know, IBM has always been you know very uh, you know forward and really passionate about what we can do with data. Um, you know, a lot of it you know is on how we can actually uh, collect data um, and not just traditional sets of data, but also, you know, sets of data that we may have not, you know, really used before. Um, and really seeing how we can use that data on really quantifying the risk aspect, right? So we know, you know, you know, for things like weather events and, and other, uh, say, climate perils, like we understand those are happening more often, but we try to really, uh, you know, take those data and really turn those into actionable insights. Um, for instance, you know, we have, you know, a very big interest around uh, things around uh, outage management. So how do we build solutions that can help reduce the amount of power outages, you know, a utility might experience? Uh, so looking at combining things like historical weather, historical in incident data, and producing, uh, you know, analytics that can really tell and inform you know, how many outages the utility might incur. Um, but also, you know, that, that's on the resiliency side, but on the kind of reliability side, also looking at how we can take, you know, data coming from, uh, say, renewable assets and, you know, using those to get, you know, things like forecasting insights, right? So how do I optimize, uh, you know, the integration of renewables you know, onto the grid? And in order to do that, we obviously need forecasting for those assets, right? So forecasting for things like solar, wind, uh, even hydro. Uh, so using uh, you know those data to, to really get actionable uh, business insights. No, that, that's uh, that's really interesting. And in terms of um, the impact of climate change on what you do, are you how are you managing that? How are you addressing and assessing the impact? Yeah, this is a, a definitely a bit a new big area that, that IBM is is very heavily uh, interested in. Uh, so we've we've been developing and creating you know new sets of capabilities. Um, you know, I, at first, really just on you know I think the kind of consulting piece in terms of how do we just 
have a conversation around climate change, right? I think, you know, it's obviously first, first and foremost in a lot of companies' mission statements, but, you know, I think the challenge is how, like, where do we start, right? So really that kind of consulting design piece. Um, and then once we kind of establish that, really looking at, as I mentioned, quantifying uh, both the physical as well as financial risks of climate change, uh, particularly for, um, you know, assets, right? So in terms of looking at the exposure uh, of, you know, say wind farms or other utility assets with respect to things like sea level rise, uh, wildfires, you know, high winds, you know, uh, flooding and so forth. So, you know, we're, we're really interested in really that whole quantification piece. Um, but also, you know, from a renewables perspective, understanding um, from a, you know, perhaps a, a utilization or a siting perspective in terms of, um, you know, how will climate change impact, uh, you know, the resourcing aspect, right? So, you know, there's research that suggests that some areas, uh, you know, will be windier than others, you know, say in 10, 20, 50 years, um, and, you know, some areas will, you know, reduce the amount of wind speed. So how does, how do the kind of long range plans take into account things like that? Uh, same thing on the solar side, right? Some areas will get, we're looking at getting more cloud cover, which obviously would have an impact on solar. So really looking at, you know, how do we, uh, you know, provide a solution that can kind of guide, uh, you know, where do I need to perhaps install uh, some of my assets on a long-term basis? So that's uh, really interesting, I, and I know um, you know work like that really helps to influence um, not just how companies and industries thinking, but also governments in in different parts of the world as well. So it's it's interesting work, um, and it really helps the industry grow, but grow in the right and sustainable way. I think is is what we're looking at here. And and on the topic, Graham, um, about keeping ourselves sustainable. Uh, one thing we're looking at is, you know, as strike rates change, we have different ways that we need to manage the global supply chain. How are, what's your experience on how we are managing that risk from a sustainability perspective, Graham? I, I think there is the the will to to look at the risk. I think there is the challenge with regards to the costs that companies have got to. Um, to build their, their projects within. Um, but we've got to challenge how we go further afield uh, and how we actually have those checks and balances. We do global audits, we do global inspections, you know, we're working across the globe in some of these areas. Uh, and, you know, it's took us a long time with regards to the European fabricators and the current supply chain industry to get them up to a level that we believe is, is good. You know, they've worked with us, we, we work together. I think we've got that challenge again as we go further afield. You know, it might be that we do go um, UAE, we might go Indonesia, etc. But again, when we're looking at going to, let's say, UAE, for instance, yeah, um, the Suez Canal, that is the normal shipping route for some of the bigger components, they actually can't fit through there. So we've got to go a different route, you know, to actually get these components to to the uh, work area, to the construction area. Yeah, um, are we looking at that when we're looking at the costs of, of the actual fabrication? Are we looking at the sustainability element that accompanies that? Yeah, it's not just simple solution at the end of the day. And I think as professionals within the industry, we've got to, to rise to those challenges and we've got to flag them up and actually pose those questions because what we don't want is in the future, um, you know, people challenging our green credentials at the end of the day. That's what we're here for. That's what we believe in. Uh, and therefore, you know, we've got to start looking at that and preparing for it. Can I just jump back slightly onto the COVID one and just yeah. pull that out? And just again, it, it came to me, yeah, during the construction elements that we've been, you know, quite a lot of construction sites have still been going. We provide um, CDM support to a lot of projects. And yeah. how many projects have actually been updating their live construction phase plans? It's a key indicator of whether we've got a grip 
on controlling and putting the control measures in on construction sites. We're up to rev eight or nine on some of our sites because you know we're up to rev six of the actual government guidance at the minute. So again, people out there, are you actually updating these documents and keeping on top of it? And if you're auditing a site, have a look at what rev revisions there at the end of the day. Yeah, that, that actually struck me when, when David was talking about safety on and the fact that they're also on Rev 9 of the industry guidance for, for COVID. And it struck me, you know, people at the moment are, are faced with lots of different sources of information on this one huge topic. And uh, it is a challenge for people at the front line and for managers and leadership to, to stay on top of keeping people safe and what is the right thing to do, for sure. I've never ever seen construction phase plans be updated so much. Um, you know, generally you go to the site and Rev 1 is still there, which is a shame. You know, it should be updated on a regular basis. Hopefully people aren't doing that just to keep abreast with what we're currently dealing with. Perfect. Thank you. And Hassa, I'm going to come back to you and talk a little bit about the sustainability and the, the green agenda, if you like, uh, for Austell. I mean, big companies are often required, um, not by law, um, but by nature of the fact they're big companies, to almost lead to the industry. What, how do you see Orthel, um participating in sustainability and the green space, if you like? Yeah, thanks for that question, Lisa. I think, uh, first of all, again, um, to put it a bit bluntly, um, I, I think it's fair to say that, that for for quite a period of time, Austin uh, can be said, I guess, to, to I mean, we, we were riding a bit uh, high on the white horse, uh, uh, sort of because uh, as a green company, uh, being renowned for transiting from black to, to, uh, uh, to green energy, uh, we were of uh, sort of the, uh, the mindset, I guess, that uh, we didn't have to, to, to uh, look in, inwards and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and strive improvement uh, in terms of, of our way of, of operating and, and, and obviously constructing uh, before that. So it, it, it's actually something we, we are, you can say, we are on a journey. Uh, first of all, um, and then of course to to emphasise that 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 journey is primarily focused around our supply chain. Um, obviously, for natural reasons, as 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 those are uh, our suppliers are the ones basically um, um, representing the, the carbon footprint, for example, mainly of of, of our activities and and, and assets. Uh, so, I mean, our, our philosophy, uh, uh, which I will say has proven successful up to now has been to, I guess, to use more carrot than stick uh, in the sense that we use our supplier relationship management program to engage with our key strategic suppliers, uh, for example, uh, for example, having the dialogue around um, usage of uh, green electricity uh, in, in, in the steel production, uh, whether it's uh, uh, around foundations, uh, uh, substations, uh, turbines. Um, and, and I mean, definitely we have uh, a long way to go, but we do see a movement. So we do see that our suppliers start to, to translate. And, and obviously uh, the next uh, difficult question is uh, who, who is paying the bill for this uh, transition? Uh, and I think, I mean, uh, certainly Austin is, is, is prepared to pay some of the, some of the bill, uh, part of the bill. Um, I, I do want to say that we are of that philosophy overall, that, that it's an industry um, um, task uh, and we need to lift that together. Uh, obviously, uh, Austin, as well as our competitors, need to, to stay competitive and, and so do our suppliers. Uh, so I think it's it's a matter of of somehow leveraging this together, mm -hmm. and I mean um, also another example is looking at our uh, vessel suppliers. Obviously, we want to engage with them uh, uh, to say like, how do we assist you switching from uh, heavy fuel to to whatever alternative uh, fueling of of your uh, bigger and heavy vessels uh, for installations and 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 service operations. And, and, and we do see again this very positive momentum starting to be created where we, we now engage with our vessel suppliers looking at like tomorrow's design or next generation design even like 
our suppliers now coming proactively uh, to us asking, is this the kind of vessel you would like to charter uh, on, on, on your next uh, wind farm? Um, for example, vessels being driven uh, on, 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 yeah, whatever green fuels, uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, natural gas, at least in a transition phase, but definitely not heavy fuels uh, uh, anymore uh, looking into the future. So I think we, we are uh, on that journey uh, and it will have a cost. And I think the, um, you could say, uh, the, the, the tricky task is, is to make it sustainable also from a cost perspective so that we all stay competitive, i.e. the whole industry will remain yes. competitive basically and the cost of energy will 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 stay low uh, compared to to coal and, and, and nuclear it's uh, an interesting point because you know when you were talking there i'm thinking how much we do collaborate now on and we heard earlier from g plus and safety on we collaborate heavily on traditional safety topics and, and even traditional environmental topics but sustainability somehow has has kind of separate um as a as a as a topic and it's maybe it maybe is a future opportunity for more cross-industry collaboration on on some of these items and, and just to kind of wrap up this session i'm going to ask a question and, and perhaps everybody just give me your opinion but it did strike me when we we're talking also on sustainability that you know do, do we have the right tools the right experience in the industry and and, and you know the right knowledge base to be able to make quick strides forward or is it your opinion that we we need to do something different or something faster or something better from, from my point of view I, I i think we need to have more knowledge and experience and understanding of what the actual challenges are there needs to be that that almost focus group on what are those challenges i don't think we've got it at the moment i think each company are trying to decide it from themselves like you said you know we've got industries we've got organizations collaboration uh, across a lot of things would, would help in my opinion Robert, any thoughts? Robert, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's still some work to be done. Um, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's you know the topic of sustainability. It's it's such a broad, you know, umbrella that I really think there you know needs to be a lot of uh, you know consideration in terms of you know what areas to focus on you know what what's you know, from a priority perspective what's more important than not you know i think there's so many areas to focus on i think it's really on uh you know setting setting priorities and setting you know obtainable uh targets for those as well um you know i think that's another piece that i think will help us uh you know all stay accountable um and, and stay actionable in terms of, of meeting those uh targets thank you and has a final word to you no, thanks. I mean, just, just uh, perhaps to to uh, to, to summarise uh, on 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 my point before in terms of, of of this is, I mean, this is a green industry, right? And and uh, the, the the green impact will be equal to the uh, speed and extent of of obviously uh, erecting turbines, uh, putting up solar panels, and so forth, um, onshore, offshore. So. I mean, again, we want to be on that sustainable uh, journey, but we also want to stay competitive so that we are actually able to uh, uh, spread out <laughs> or expand the business uh, with as high a pace as possible. Um, and, and, and I think that is being acknowledged. Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, perhaps a final statement, I mean, it will also be up to, uh, to our customers uh, I mean, to to the companies and governments investing uh, in, in, for example, a, a wind farm to say, when we go out and tender, uh, we, we put it out as, as a, a clear criteria. To win this contract, you need to demonstrate a sustainable way of uh, developing uh, the perimeter uh, to, to install the turbines and, and, and uh, to operate 
the park uh, throughout the next 25 years. And, and yeah. that is not quite the case today. So, so uh, perhaps just a call out of it to, to that layer as well. Uh, we are definitely prepared and, and, and so uh, uh, is our, our suppliers, uh, I see. No, I, I agree. The, the motivation is there. We, we, we would like a level playing field and understand the criteria better. Yeah, agree. So, listen, thank you, Hassa, Rob and Graham. Um, please stay where you are. Um, we are going to go and move into the more open Q&A session now. I'm going to ask uh, David Armour and David Dave Griffiths to join us back on the panel. Um, and then a reminder to everybody, please uh, send your questions directly to me, Lisa Mallon. Um, I, have a, I have a few in the chat session already. Um, I'm happy to take more. So there's plenty of time. We have all panellists available. And um, I, will, I will get us started with some questions of my own. Uh, whilst we wait for some questions to come through. So, Dave, one for you just to kick off. We've talked a lot um, over the course of the last hour about industry collaboration. Well, how would you sum up the benefits of industry collaboration from your experiences so far with, with G+. I think for me, um, just sort of speed to market in terms of knowledge transfer. Um, you know, that's been really important. Um, you've got lots of industry experts who are drawn on, uh, you know, previous experience as well. I noticed there was a question that came in on the, the general chat regarding, you know, the link into oil and gas. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of benefit in that area. Um, but I think probably, um, certainly from the, the early stages of, of G+, going as far as that um, interface with the regulator as well. So we're, we're in step together to mm -hmm. deliver a better industry solution. Um, but certainly, I, my personal view, just to respond to your initial question, is really about that, that sort of speed to market. You know, we can move, we're much more agile. Uh, we can uh, reconcile issues very quickly. We can look at a broader industry issue. And I'll, on, a, on many occasions, not all, um, someone has been there before and has yeah. dealt with that. And, and I think it's a useful, you know, it's a good baseline to start from. And then, as we've said, from a safe by design perspective, for example, or good practice guidelines, you've got industry experts around the table. And it just brings that knowledge to the market far quicker. So I guess any new market entrant, you aren't starting with a blank piece of paper. No, thank you. Thank you, Dave. I think that's a, a great point. Um, yeah, definitely a great point. The quicker we can learn lessons from whether it's our own industry or our colleagues or whether it's another industry, then the better for everybody overall. So there's a question came in here from Duncan uh, and he's asking about what are the key areas where the industry can innovate to help improve and optimise health and safety performance. It, it is not directed to anybody in particular, but um, Rob, I think it's useful for you to make comment on this, and then um, perhaps David Armour, if you want to take the question as well. So, how can the industry innovate to help improve and optimise health and safety performance? Sorry, is that coming to me first? Or? You can go first. Go ahead, David. But it's okay. So I think we've kind of seen it ramping up over the last couple of years. The use of technology to overcome some problems that eliminate some of the hazards that we've got. The the drone technology um, to avoid working uh, working at height activities is a really good example of that. That's going on leaps and bounds. It's just getting better all the time. Kind of thing. The, the other thing is there is some very innovative solutions to the COVID problem to allow us to continue to work that I think it would be a shame if they dropped off post COVID. So, you know, further, further use of digitization on use device based solutions rather than paper, you know, these kind of things, even and I said this at another thing about that earlier in the week, even what we're doing now, the um, the use of conferencing is going to be normal next year if we get about this next year kind of thing. This will be a normal solution. And again, that cuts down travel time, driving bad weather, going to remote states, and, and the environmental impact as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. there are quite a lot of things out there that we have done that I think we need to keep doing kind of thing and build on. Rob, I, I don't know if you want to add to that at all. Um... And maybe just highlight maybe more on along the data side and how data can be used to help innovate. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, I think, especially in today's, you know, climate, I think, you know, companies need to be, uh, you know, I guess more, more open to, you know, exploring, uh, you know, some of the capabilities, you know, around artificial intelligence, you know, as, as many companies are, uh, of course, but I really think there needs to be um, a little bit more, um, you know, investment put, put towards, you know, um, you know, technologies that are not, not just helping from the data side, but also the analytics. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, great technology out there and, um, you know, I know some, some utilities are moving or some energy companies are moving faster than others, but, you know, in order to really, uh, you know, be prepared, you know, for, for things, you know, whether it's a weather disaster or another pandemic, um, you know, I think it's in terms of kind of shifting mindset, I think it really needs to be, uh, you know, looked at, or at least, you know, allocated some, some more investment and some more time and, you know, a lot of that I think is really uh, not just for the utility, but also being more open to you know collaboration and partnerships. Uh, you know, even just some some benchmarking with with other entities. Um, you know, that's that that's I think something that's you know needs to be embraced as as we uh, kind of tackle these challenges uh, together. Okay. Thank you, Graham. Did you are you popped on my screen? I wasn't sure if you wanted to add in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll skip that one. <laughs> no, perfect, thank you. So, a uh, question here actually, and, and, and perhaps, uh, you know, Griffiths, I think you've spent some time with Petra Kem, so I'll, I'll come to you and, and anybody else that wants to offer some question, answer here. So, the question comes from Stephen, and he's asking, what are some of the key challenges, but also opportunities in health and safety? With the announcement that a lot of the oil and gas major companies are scaling up their investment um, and to a certain extent, you know, switching a little bit to renewables. I think for me, uh, I saw that question come through. I can only see opportunity, if I'm honest. Um, you know, we're, we're at the we're in the middle of a, a you know a, a huge expansion of offshore wind. Um, the oil and gas technology that's been developed and proven over a a long, long period of time. You know, we can draw on that reference. Clearly, the, the oil and gas sector is, is changing from an employment perspective, so there's a huge amount of opportunity in terms of transfer of skills. I think one area that I identified that was probably about um, five years ago, we, we took the um, offshore safety case, which is obviously mm -hmm. a le legislative requirement for the oil and gas operators, and we simplified that for, um, for SSE in the offshore wind sector and, and some of that process and rigour that supplied the oil and gas sector, I think can massively improve uh, safety within um, the renewable sector. Uh, there's a, I, I can only see opportunities, if I'm being honest, but certainly that transfer of skills, um, the rigour that's applied and been learnt, um, you know, potentially the hard way, historically, yeah. uh, I think they can bring to our sector. Uh, and they've continued to innovate as the financial pressures have, have been born on this sector as well. So I think it lends itself really well to the mindset of renewables, um, and certainly, you know, being leaner and, uh, and, and greener, to use Hass's, uh, you know, phrase. Uh, I think, for, you know, it, I can only see opportunity. Potentially some of the challenges may be around the, uh, the investment costs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a different margin proposition. Um, from uh, you know uh, an oil uh, or gas asset to a uh, renewable sector, and maybe there's just a bit of learning. But you know, just speaking on behalf of uh, SSE uh, and similar to you know many of the other members uh, of G Plus, we're already in deep JVs with oil and gas operators, and uh, it's been advantageous from the start. Hassa, anything you'd like to add to that about whether there's challenges or opportunities from oil and gas companies entering the market? Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I mean, I can only echo uh, what, what uh, David is saying here. I think uh, definitely the entry of, of uh, uh, oil and gas majors into renewables uh, for me presents more opportunity than challenge. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll have uh, commercial colleagues uh, <laughs> saying the, the, the opposite, uh, but, but I mean, uh, on the longer horizon, this will uh, push again uh, the industry to become more uh, uh, self-sufficient and, and, and competitive. Um, I mean, we've seen the oil majors coming in with very uh, aggressive uh, bids. 
Um, at the same time, they are uh, injecting a lot of experience uh, in terms of marine construction and, and, and operations and so forth. So, so I think, I, I mean, I, I bid that welcome, of course. Um, I think uh, there, is a, there is a learning curve also for oil and gas majors. Um, and, and of course, uh, um, the, the devil's playing the devil's advocate. You, you, uh, one could fear that um, an oil major coming in uh, with a very, again, with a very aggressive uh, bid, um, relying on, on uh, experience and somehow a knowledge base fr from uh, the, the, uh, the oil industry. And, and perhaps having that experience uh, quite a steep learning curve uh, because I mean, uh, uh, I have experience from, from both uh, camps as well, and I, and, and I, I do not see necessarily the, the overlap constantly um, playing in. And, and, and it's just, I think there will be a learning curve. That, that's the point, basically, for, for, for new players coming in, even, even from the oil and gas sector. Uh, and and as, as David was, uh, was alluding to, I mean, uh, we are good at um, consolidating ourselves uh, into joint ventures. And, and, and again, uh, that is only generating an even bigger uh, knowledge transfer and, and, and flow of, of best practice. So I, I definitely welcome that part. No, thank you. And, and both of you have mentioned cost there in the last few minutes. And there's a question here that's come in from Louise, who's asking for, for new marine renewable energy technologies where the cost has been driven down very quickly. How do we ensure that in our industry, health and safety remains a priority? How do we make sure that that balance is kept correctly? Any thoughts, um, Hassan, just to kick off? I think, I mean, if, 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 if I look at the, sort of the, the, the journey of the, the marine industry to support uh, the continued sort of improvement of health and safety uh, in, in the renewable industry, I mean, I, I think I see uh, that direction is, is right. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I can say we are on target, um, but, but I think, I mean, we are seeing um improvements product improvements design improvements for example uh like uh also is 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 uh, these days promoting uh, our, our new uh, boat landing pre foundation uh of course that has an interface to what types of vessels and and and, and how you are um uh, transferred in in a, in a safe manner uh also uh in terms of having uh, redundancy and backup solutions in place uh, it, it puts some kind of of requirement to the marine industry to be able to provide safe solutions uh, to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think there is a constant, again, uh, again, push and momentum around developing new solutions. And it goes also back to the to the point around sustainability that, that we are on that journey together, I think. So developers together with, with the supply chain um, are, are in this together, so to speak, and, and, and at least from what I see, both from an Austria perspective and our competitors as well, I mean, we are asking for uh, improved HSE-wise, improved solutions. Yeah. Uh, even uh, uh, it would have a certain cost. So, so, so I think that that, that is some, somehow a positive trend, uh, at least uh, across the industry. Yeah, and, and for me, that what comes into my head is making sure as leaders people are holding themselves accountable, regardless of the market space, because the industry is growing fast, you know, the costs get compressed, but the leaders of the business, the leaders that are making decisions here, need to hold themselves accountable and be held accountable also for making sure um, that we stay on the right track in terms of our performance on health, safety and sustainability targets as well. Yeah, Lisa, if I could just chip in, I, I think, you know, as, as both David uh, Armour of emphasise from a safety on a G plus perspective, you know, you, just to touch on the point that you raised there about you know holding accountable, you know holding people accountable and holding ourselves accountable. Without doubt, those forums do that. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got senior commitment. Um, you know, we all invest equally uh, into that forum. So there's a there's almost a, a seat at the top table within each of you know all the respective organisations to to reflect on that. 
I always say that, you know, good safety is good business. Um, you know, it's an investment. And I think what we've seen over the years is that as technology has improved and we've almost introduced industry standards or, you know, good or best practice or best available technology, if you use the, you know, the terminology from the regulator, the costs yeah. actually come down overall. So I think, you know, when you look at the, the sort of uh, the curve of costs, generally it will come down. So I think we might see some, um, you know, peaks of costs regarding, you know, new technology required for further offshore wind, um, perhaps new te technology in that area. But overall, when, we, when you look at the, the life cycle of the wind farm, you know, you know certainly we've seen some cost reduction and in, in various pieces of technology as that's progressed. But certainly, you know, I think the mantra has got to be that, you know, safety is an investment and we can't lose sight of that. And we do need to hold the, the senior executives of all organisations accountable for that. Yeah, it's almost like a positive peer pressure. It has to be. It has to yeah. be. We want to send people home safely, and uh, you know we've got to invest in that. And and David Armour, um, when you were talking earlier, you mentioned the HSC quite a, a well, not a few times, I think once or twice. Yeah. And, and that working partnership. What, what does that? What does that? What do they have in terms of role to play here in making sure we hold ourselves accountable? How do? How does that partnership work? So I think I mean I think we are lucky in our industry that we have got an active, quite a small regulator for our industry, for especially for you know the team here. We kind of everybody knows the inspectors, everybody knows who's coming to the sites. You know, but it's quite a small team. Um, I think you know they're, they're very involved. They have communicated get letters out quite regularly for from them, letting us understand what their feelings are. Just touching on the point uh, from the original question. Uh, one of the one of the correspondents from the HSE highlighted uh, a kind of uh, the worry that the, the message wasn't getting through the cost cutting was leading to corner cutting up on the job and safety versus towards safety. Kind of when we kind of asked the, the regulator on that one, their belief was that the message may be at a senior level within groups like G Plus and Safety on. But it's ensuring that message gets right through the business. It could, it gets, it could get diluted. I think the term used was diluted. Mm -hmm. When it gets to the middle level of a business, and you kind of lose sight of the safety in favour of maybe delivering one time, one budget, you know, that kind of thing. The other thing, kind of now, and, and able kind of maybe appreciate this as well. Earlier involvement, you know, that's that's it as well. Bringing bringing the safety professionals right in at the beginning when they should be with that project and actually advising. them. Rather than being involved in what goes wrong or what it looks like it's going to go wrong, it's obviously retrospective. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my feelings on it. Thanks, David. And your line, I think, is breaking up a little bit. I hope it's not mine anyway, <laughs> but uh, just, as a, just as a heads up. Okay, we're rolling into the last few minutes of the Q&A sessions. I've got a couple more questions here from delegates online. Um, one in particular from Harry Moss around service integrity and process safety, and what standards really exist for operational excellence in our in our industry. Um, I guess, David, I'm going to come to you first, David Griffiths. To because I, just because I know personally what what H, um, SSE are involved in. Yeah, so 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 we've drawn quite heavily, Lisa, um, on our thermal experience from a process safety perspective. Um, we've taken the rigor that we've applied there, used the the engineering uh, codes um, that are already in place, and tried to stay in step uh, with any learnings from that. We set out process and asset safety uh, with an SSE as one of our uh, core pillars. Uh, there's one of eight, uh, and there's a there's a working group in each uh, directorate that focuses purely on process safety and asset safety within the business. And I think what we've identified more so than the sort of um, engineering codes, etc., because we we have that, and that may need to develop to support the uh, renewable sector. Mm -hmm. What we've identified is that we right now we probably don't use a lot of the data that we have. We capture thousands of pieces of information and I'm not sure that we actually use that to our advantage. So I, I think, you know, in terms of a silver lining of COVID, um, it has really accelerated our uh, you know digitization within SSE. 
uh, we you know number of benefits in terms of you know the usual connectivity for personnel but also looking at the data that we have and how we can use that more effectively going forward so from a process safety perspective we're, we're building on a long history with an SSE um, but we've really focused on that in the last three years to try and bring uh, ongoing improvements and you know um, simplifying our processes looking at um, our process hazard review process we have improved our um, process safety reviews, which have uh, gated touch points as we develop projects through to operation. So it, it, it's a kind of continuous improvement, Lisa. There's not a we've not identified something that's going to make a you know a huge step change, yeah. but it's very much continuous improvement. But certainly one area that we've identified in the last twelve months has been we need to use our data far more effectively. No, it's a it's a great point. That's a great point. And Rob, perhaps on the, the data aspect of that, is there anything you can add from, from your experiences so far in our industry? Yeah, I mean, I think from a standards perspective, I, I think it's, you know, I think it's evolving uh, over time, uh, you know, especially with, uh, you know, looking at things around, you know, transparency and trust and, and privacy and uh, you know, there's, that's always, you know, first and foremost, at least, at least from kind of IBM's uh, perspective. Um, so, you know, I would say uh, it's, it's definitely changing, um, you know, in the positive direction to make sure that, uh, you know, the data that say we collect, um, you know, there's there's transparency in terms of how we collect that, uh, you know, what we do with that data, um, you know, things around biases and and, and things so forth. Uh, so there's there's definitely a lot of uh, careful consideration, and you know we're always looking at ways to uh, you know improve that, um, and it's obviously very dependent upon you know the types of of, of projects. Um, you know some are of course more more sensitive than others, but um, you know we we try to be uh, you know, as, as transparent as as we can. No, thank you. So uh, last question from the the delegates on the call um, is around floating wind. Um, and the question is, you know, what additional challenges will floating wind bring to our industry? Uh, Hassa, do you want to have a, a go at um, answering that question? And then Dave Griffin, I'll perhaps come to you after. Yeah, sorry, Lisa, could you repeat the question? The line uh, was a bit broken. Sure, no problem. So the question is, what additional challenges will floating wind bring to our industry from a safety okay. perspective? Got it, thanks. Um, yeah, floating winds, uh, uh, interesting stuff. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, uh, ob obviously, uh, f uh, from an after perspective, uh, we, we see that floating wind is, is, is something uh, interesting to, to explore as, as an innovation lever. Uh, I, I don't think we can say that, that floating wind has been in any way um, to this point in time, uh, been established as 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 like a serious uh, um, alternative to 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 fixed installation turbines um, offshore. I mean, I, I I think one one thing is the the, the basic engineering uh, challenge. Obviously, I'm not an expert here, but 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 making it uh, work uh, in, uh, while ensuring a proper uh, sort of uh, yield um, um, take out uh, from from the design. Um, I mean, we 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 want to to limit um, looking at health and safety uh, and and that perspective. Obviously, always uh, uh, O and M activities um, uh, during the lifetime of the turbine. So I think uh, floating winds uh, obviously present that that uh, interesting uh, opportunity. I would I would then point that in, in the challenge. To say like like if, if you if you end up for example being able to uh, to transfer the turbines in and out by by simple means of a tugboat or whatever, and and service them uh, ashore uh, in a, in a, in a protected harbour uh, area, that 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 will uh, present uh, major improvements. Um, yep. Lisa, can I come in there? Yes, please. Yeah, we're, we're involved early days in uh, floating wind. Uh, uh, very early days, pre-feed uh, on on uh, some major projects, uh, and the 
that it's different technology. Yeah, it, 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 it's new, it's exciting. There are challenges with regards to operability. There are challenges with regards to the actual O&M phase, uh, just purely by how these things actually operate and the stability uh, challenges that are there. Now, we touched on earlier uh, the influence of oil and gas. Oil and gas are bringing solutions to the party with regards to floating wind. You know, there are some of the technologies that they have been involved in for many, many years. Um, so it, it's actually exciting if we, if we get it right, if we, you know, take the CDN in first and look and review at the hazards and risks associated with it early. We can put the control measures in place. You know, we can make it as safe as fixed installations, but it's going to take a lot of time and effort. But, you know, it is exciting technology. It is almost the future of where we need to go moving forward. Uh, and I can just see uh, you know, the positives. Yeah, hey, thank you. So listen, thank you for all my panelists today. Um, I'm going to ask you just to sum up your key learning you would like people to take from the session today um, in no particular order. Um, I'll go for you, Graham, because you're on my screen in front of me first. <laughs> no problem. I think the, the, the key from today is we do have a challenge with regards to COVID. Yeah. Are we up to speed? Are we up to date? And are we complying on site? Are we actually implementing? It's all right putting things down on paper, but are we doing the checks and verifications on that? And just on the sustainability part, challenge, challenge what we're actually doing. Don't just accept what's happening. Yeah, well, let's have a look in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Good purpose. Yeah, I think for me, we've touched on collaboration quite a bit through this uh, webinar, Lisa. So, you know, I'd encourage everybody to collaborate. We'll, we will get quicker solutions through collaboration, um, faster, you know, quicker to market, potentially uh, more commercially viable. Um, so I, I think if anybody's got challenges in their sector, even the, the, you know, the emerging sector of floating wind, reach out. There are forums available to tap into, and there's a lot of very good information and very well backed up information already available through G Plus Safety on Energy Institute in particular. So there's a lot of information already there. Um, but yeah, collaboration for me would be my key message today. Thank you. Hassa, I'll pass over to you. Yeah. Sorry, what was that, uh, Lisa? Just, Just uh, your, your final. Take away from the session today. What would you like people to take away? Yeah, thanks. So, so I, uh, I mean, for for me, uh, we we have been around uh, now several topics. Uh, ob obviously, uh, starting by by having a bit uh, focus around the, the the COVID situation, and and uh, I I do like the mix a bit here, where we are also able to to zoom out and 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 uh, focus uh, the objective more long term. I, I think. Uh, one common headline here is standardization and, and it talks in obviously to the um, promotion of, of both uh, G plus and safety on. I mm -hmm. think uh, as, as we look at, at, at further globalization, um, regardless of being offshore wind, uh, onshore wind, uh, solar PV, uh, floating wind, what have you, I mean, it, it is about standardizing uh, all our best practices uh, in order to to make this uh, journey like competitive and and, and long term sustainable as as a business. Um, so 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 that would be my key message. Thanks, Hi. Rob. Yourself. Yeah, I and mean, I'm coming at it from a little bit different perspective, but um, you know, I think the kind of theme around you know resiliency in terms of how can we kind of rethink um, you know ways in which we can uh, create solutions you know around being resilient, not just from you know the weather and climate side, but also for other uh, you know events that come our way. Um, you know, so I think resiliency is you know the main point um, there. Uh, as well as looking at, you know, I know we're obviously focused more on, you know, short-term risk, but uh, again, I, I think, um, you know, it's important to have uh, a little more um, uh, eagerness to explore uh, longer range, you know, impacts to, to our business here and see how we can kind of get out ahead of that. Thank you. And finally, David Armour. Thanks, Mika. Uh, for me, um, it kind of ties back to what we said earlier on. 
the, the industry's under a bit of pressure. It's uh, COVID's hitting us quite hard. You know, we're encountering you know, acceleration programs that are maybe could be thought out better, and it's putting you know a lot of further pressure on the people. Just, just ask if you're if you're trying to recover lost time because of COVID, plan it properly. You know, and just take the time and consider the impact on the workforce and all that. You know, Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so let me just, uh, and, and again, thank you to the panelists there for the Q and A session and for the de um, the delegates on the line for posing some questions. So I'd like to just take a couple of minutes and, and sum up for me some of the the key takeaways as well from the session. You know, at the start we heard from Dave talking about G plus and the stats that you put up on the screen of an injury every three days and a, a dropped object every four days. You know, really stuck with me, and and therefore the importance for good practice guidelines, collaboration across the industry is is more important than ever. You know, especially as we move into new markets as companies, you know, to make sure that we're not repeating errors or mistakes that we've had in the past. Um, secondly, we you know we heard from David Almer talking about the safety on. Again, another great example of how collaboration um, can really pay dividends. And uh, they've demonstrated that very ably in this pandemic period, where as an industry across the UK, the team was able to come together and put some guidelines in place that made it helpful and clearer to you know the frontline for managers and for people working and interfacing with our industry. You know, I think back to Hassa and what he talked about at the start, you know, we we focus a lot on the fact that we do need to learn from this pandemic. You know, we need to look at our own contingency plans, what worked, what didn't work, what would we do next time, and really think about that now for the next, whether it's a pandemic or some other crisis, so that we are more prepared and we're more able to be in control. And also, to not forget about the impact of mental health to employees and to the people that interact with us in the workplace and at sites, because you know that that is a bigger impact. And my takeaway there is, you know, just are are you in control? Do you know what the risks are, and do you know where the risks are as well? And then when I think about Rob and, and his discussion points, uh, we talked about how do we make ourselves more resilient? How do we make sure we look at the data and prepare ourselves for future proofing and, and understanding what the data is telling us. How do we balance that risk and how do we allow the data to give us some actionable insights to make us grow and be better longer term? And then Graham, to finish off, you know, thinking about as we go bigger, um, as we go to different markets, are we thinking far enough ahead to be future proof? You know, uh, your example of the Suez Canal stuck in my head and and also this idea of you know do we really even have the right still skills and competencies in our industry available to us and even tools available to us to be able to manage this so a really great session i really appreciate everybody's input and um, most importantly my speakers today but also our ei knowledge partner ibm for partnering and graham for you and steel river consultants for sponsoring the webinar today so just as a final wrap up, um, I want to remind everybody that the webinar has been recorded. You will receive a link to the webinar um, shortly thereafter. But also you will see um, a request for feedback on the, the seminar as well. And we'd be really grateful if you would take the, a few minutes to give us some feedback because it will help us develop and tailor future sessions to your needs. With that, thank you very much.